Hello guys, welcome to the stream. Thank you very much for being with us. We are having the special guest. I didn't mention too much about our guest because in a moment he will introduce himself <clears throat> and you will see why this, the, this guest is special. Our friend Dr. Patzer, our friend Justin, and in the meantime you'll see why he's so passionate about chess. But uh, before that I'll just uh, let you know that I, uh, if I can say that, met uh, our friend Dr. Patzer with uh, chess, uh, chess Journey, because he had the interview two years ago with uh, our friend Dr. Kevin Skull. Therefore it's something like the connection from all of the chess community. Welcome to the stream, my friend. How are you? I'm fine. How are you? I'm great. Thank you very much. I'm pretty happy that you just accepted the invitation and we can just talk about chess. And if you can introduce yourself and tell us about yourself a little bit, how did you pop up in a chess community? When did you start playing chess and so on? It would be fantastic. Uh, great. Uh, well, big questions. Um, I don't know when I popped up. Um, I, I've let, let's start with the beginning. Let's start when I learned playing chess. Uh, that was many, many years ago. Mm -hmm. um, I was probably somewhere around 10 years old, I think. Yeah. A friend of the family uh, bought us a chess set and my brother and I learned how to play and we just learned the basic rules and no formal teaching, not anything like that. So we just played for fun and uh, for, I don't know, more than 20 years I had no idea there was such a thing as a chess club the chess book things like that so it's it was first when when I was about 30 years old that I started thinking that hmm I want to develop as a chess player uh, and I started looking into things like chess books and chess clubs uh, I started playing online and um, well things grew from there and uh, like many other players, I bought a bunch of books and I st started trying to find the perfect book, the book that would take me from my patser level to a master level. Um, and I bought one book after the other and I didn't read many of them. <laughs> then, sounds familiar, by the way. <laughs> sounds familiar, yeah. I've heard many people talk like this. Uh -huh. uh, and um, one day I said to myself that, well, I have about 20 chess books unread on my shelf. I need to start reading them. And then I actually counted them and they were twice as many. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I had read more than half of one book. So, so I decided for myself that I'm going to read these books. So how will I do that? How will I make sure that it happens? So I thought that I need to create some kind of outside accountability. Mm -hmm. So I decided that I, I'm going to... <coughs> <clears throat> create a blog where I write about these books as I read. By the way, for, sorry for a short int uh, interruption. I just put the link to your blog into the chat. Guys, if you'd like to read right. our friend's content, he's uh, making great stuff that chess books uh, review most often. But at the same time, we'll be talking about chess progress at the second part as well. Therefore, don't go anywhere. Please continue. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so, <coughs> so, so I started, uh, I think it was 2019 that I, I uh, wrote my first uh, blog post on the first book that I read cover to cover, mm -hmm. The Amateur's Mind by Jeremy Silman. I yeah. still love this book by this day. I know many people have different opinions about the book. Some think it's so-so. Uh, I still think it's great. Um, I've, I've reread it a couple of times and I think it's a, a really brilliant book. And this is a book that really took my chess understanding from just what I gathered by playing to some kind of structure for how to think about chess strategy and things like that. Mm -hmm. And that may I ask uh, about the book because we'll be talking about books more, more yeah. and more. Uh, how did the, uh, the books help you to understand chess better and play in a more coherent way, if I can say that, because there are many various books, but if you are just yeah. talking about specific one, what was the book, uh, let's say, value or the benefits from reading the book that changed your game, I would say, forever? Uh, I think this this book is a perfect example of that, because uh, I, I had spent most of my time just playing online games, usually 15 plus 10, that was my go-to time control at the time. And I was just playing 
by basic tactics. Mm -hmm. I was trying to fork pieces, I was trying to make discovered attacks and win material, and just very, very fundamental stuff. I mm -hmm. had no plan, I, I had no idea about opening systems, I had no idea about pawn structures, about strategic concepts whatsoever. And this book made me understand that there is, in fact, such a thing as chess strategy. Mm -hmm. uh, and basically what I took away from it was that you can think about the pieces in different ways and that they have different purposes. For instance, you want the knights to sort of take out, uh, take up outposts in center and things like that. You want the bishops to control the long diagonals. You want the, the rooks on the open files. I didn't know how to use the pieces properly before, but this book helped me to build the foundation around that mm -hmm. uh, with the system of imbalances, with, which I think is really great for beginning players. Um, and really, my biggest takeaway was that you need to give your pieces potential. They don't have to do something right away. They don't have to attack something that doesn't have to be a direct tactic, but you need to have the potential for an, a tactic. If you take, for instance, uh, a fianchetto bishop, mm -hmm. <coughs> usually it's hiding behind the knight. And in many cases, there are pawns in the center that block the bishop's view, so to speak. Yeah. But if you move the knight, if the pawns are traded off, then the diagonal opens up and the bishop, bishop becomes awesome. Right. Mm -hmm. So placing the bishop on, say, g2 or g7 or whatever, whichever square you can get, or the, the bishop, that gives it potential that you can build on, that gives you the foundation for plan. And things like that was completely foreign to me before I read this book. And this really opened my eyes to mm -hmm. the possibilities of, of doing this. So that was really, really an eye-opening, um, for sure. Okay, excellent. And maybe let's get into the <clears throat> second part because we are just having a lot of various questions that we'll be discussing. But especially I am interested uh, about uh, one of the stuff that will be leading into that chess progress slowly. What does it feel like to start playing chess as an adult? Because you mentioned that you just played when you were the young boy, but probably it was not that, let's say, long period and probably it was not that much influential on you that you make some like stronger. Therefore, I treat you like adult chess improver, especially as we are just having more and more people like you that are just uh, falling in love in chess at, uh, as an adult. How does it feel like? And do you have some comparison between your friends, maybe between your, let's say, uh, friends, uh, kids and so on? So like, how can you compare it? How can you feel that? Well, I... I don't really know how to answer that, but but when when I was doing um, the military service uh, in Norway, where where I come from, uh, I had a few friends there that we, we used to play chess on the breaks and so on, and mm -hmm. we were all pretty evenly matched. And uh, uh, I had one friend; he was probably a bit better than I was, and he was beating me slightly more often than I was beating him, mm -hmm. and. Uh, after I started studying chess, uh, I, I played him a couple of years ago and I was just crushing him uh, without even trying. Mm -hmm. uh, so that really shows the power of knowing a bit more than just the basic stuff, how the pieces work and being able to calculate simple tactics. Especially you know, in a structured way, right? You're not some yeah, like making the exactly. random moves, but some like a coherent part, even if it is yeah. not super solid, but coherent one, right? Yeah, exactly. You, you know a bit of principles and you perhaps in some cases have the ability to calculate more than just one or two moves ahead. Mm -hmm. uh, so that kind of training really, really helps a lot uh, to elevate your chess higher yeah um, but uh, on the whole I mean being a sort of beginner uh, as an adult it's kind of tough because you don't have that foundation you, you don't have the the fluidity that comes with learning chess properly as a kid I, I learned the game as a kid but I only learned the rules basically mm -hmm. no one taught me how to think ahead or try to build a strategy or, or even even play a functional opening <laughs> it was just the pieces move like this go ahead play mm -hmm. uh, you're on your own <laughs> yeah exactly so so i really had to learn all this stuff uh, um, from the beginning 
And I remember I, I the first very first chess book that I read was My System by Linus Oh my goodness. Uh, <laughs> Not the best choice, I would say. No, uh -huh. it was far from the best choice. <laughs> uh, and I remember reading that book and I, I had no skills. I had no for, uh, sort of understanding of the uh, the uh, language that surrounds chess, how to, to sort of verbalize the things that happen on the board. So, I remember reading, um, this was in Swedish, uh, and in Europe, as you know, uh, when you talk about winning or sacrificing in a, qua or a quality mm -hmm. uh, or, or, or an exchange, yeah. that's usually called a quality. Mm -hmm. And, and Nimswich was describing uh, in some passage here uh, a quality sacrifice. And now I understand that that's sacrificing the exchange. Mm -hmm. right? But at the time, I had no idea there was yeah. such a thing. So I thought that a quality sacrifice, that's just a good sacrifice. Mm -hmm. Because and, it's and a quality, that, right? Quality yeah. things is like a, something good one. Yeah, it sounds like <laughs> something good. Uh -huh. so this is a good good sacrifice. Yeah. That was sort of my understanding. So, so I was, th this book was completely over my head. Mm -hmm. I had no idea how to read it. I had no idea what he's, he was trying to say. Yeah. Uh, and what I got out of the book was basically nothing. I was exposed to some chess, but I didn't really understand anything. So it was a few years later that I picked up other Silman's book uh, that I really understood that, aha, so these are some, th some of the concepts that are really important to know. And then a couple of years ago, I reread my system and then it sort of clicked that, ah, mm. so this is what it is. Aha was. effect. Yeah. <laughs> So, so my system is a horrible first book, yeah, unless you're I agree. a genius. Mm -hmm. uh, but once you're a bit on the way, you've probably read a few books, you have some, some practice, you're sort of into the chess culture, then I think it's quite, quite an okay book. Uh, but it's not the greatest, of course, but, uh, but it's quite okay, I think. That's mm -hmm. also very controversial. I mean, there are people just hating on that book, but... Um, I think I think it's actually quite okay. Mm -hmm. I, if I can add a little bit about Nimzovich's book, because I have practically speaking the same experiences as you, that's why I'm smiling additionally. That is the case that I have uh, the same idea how you were work out about that, uh, let's say, obstacles at the beginning, because I have uh, feeling the same. Because I started with uh, Nimzovich books uh, being pretty much lower rated, and I was I'm like uh, trying to understand the ideas that was completely over my head but what's more difficult the books that i read was the book in polish but the translation was horrible translation was horrible oh. there was just the typo about the <clears throat> the moves that were illegal there was the very awkward translation there was the lack of modern let's say uh, examples about some like comparison and so on and i was pretty much devastated what i uh, took from this book if i can say about nimsovich is the is the part about tactics about tactics is pretty decent of course nowadays there are way better books than nimsovich one but let's say about about uh, tactical stuff about let's say the double attack discovery check and so on i was fascinated by the part but the rest one was something like a little bit disjointed so like if you just put all yeah. of the parts together and there's no matter if this is having the coherent part or not, but it's you, you want to solve the book. And that's why yeah. uh, if people are asking me about rec book recommendation and they are talking about Nimzovich my system, I say categor categorically no, because it's not a great choice. But in yeah. the meantime, I will be addressing the questions from the chat because I'm looking at the chat. And one of the questions for our friend is, uh, how do you work with chess book? What is your let's say, a procedure, what is your habits to work with chess book, especially with the chess paper book, right? Because we are talking yeah. about these books the most often. Yeah. And, and for the most part, I, I read books on paper. Mm -hmm. um, I, I've read just a couple of uh, digital books, yeah. uh, but I, I find that I sort of switch off my brain when I read it digitally. So I, I try to read uh, on paper. Um, in the beginning, I used to have a chess set. I used to work through all the positions and, and make the moves on the board and really stop to think and, and things like that. I still stop to think, of course, but uh, for the most part, when I read the chess book, I try to treat it half as instruction, um, you know, what, what, the, what the author wants to convey, mm -hmm. and half as a visualization exercise. Oh. So, so I 
in 90% of the cases I read without the chess set. Um, in some cases, the positions are too complex or the variations are too long. Mm -hmm. So I need to either bring out the set or I use my phone and I just enter the moves in, in any chess app, basically. Uh, often I, I use uh, one of these, I forget the names, but you have these apps that can scan a position from mm -hmm. the book yeah. and you can, you can enter the moves from mm -hmm. there. So you can start from the diagram and, the, and then continue on. So that's usually my approach. So I think that the way I read chess books in, in that I don't make the moves on the board, I think I don't get as much out of the books if you, if you want to look at the precise things that the author wants to emphasize. Mm -hmm. But I find that it really, really helps my visualization. And I think my visualization has increased enormously uh, throughout the, the past couple of years reading the books. And part of the reason why I've, I've been doing this is that uh, for a couple of years I was reading, reading books on the train commuting to and from work. Oh, interesting. And I found out that, that using a chess set while sitting on the train, you hold the book in one hand and you hold the set in another hand and mm -hmm. you try to make the moves. It was just so awkward. So I said, okay, forget about the chess set. I'm just going to use the book. I'm going to try to visualize the moves and, and the positions. And at first it was super hard, mm -hmm. of course. Uh, but I find that this is something that you can train just like any other skill that you, you can get better at visualization. Um, so I think that has been sort of the main thing that I get, get away from the books that, that I really, really train my visualization skills. Mm -hmm. uh, so so I, I don't necessarily recommend this as an approach for everyone. Uh, if you want to train visualization, sure, it's great. Mm -hmm. If you want to get the maximum out of the books, I think you probably should have a set, yeah. unless you're already really great at visualization. Mm -hmm. And in the uh, meantime, <coughs> if you are talking about Nimzovich, because it was Nimzovich that we are called for, Nimzovich just mentioned that <coughs> if you would like to have a very good experience about uh, understanding the idea what the art offers want to Sure, you should have two uh, boards actually. The yes. one is the physical one, and the second one's additional. For example, if there are deviations, you set up two identical positions, play out the deviations on the one one, uh, on the second one, and having on the first one the original position that you can always come back. Nowadays, of course, the applications, yeah. all of the programs can make it a way faster and more, more, way more comfortable, right? Yeah, yeah. And, and there, are, of course, different tools you can use uh, for that purpose. I mean, for, ins for instance, Lee Chess Study is great mm -hmm. for doing things like that. I, When I read um, Capablanca's book, um, I forget the name. Chess Fundamentals? Yes, thank mm -hmm. you. No problem. Um, I actually entered all the games into a Lee Chess Study, mm -hmm. uh, and then I analyzed the games on my own before reading the book. Mm -hmm. So I worked through everything, annotated the games, made my analysis, my assessment of the positions, and then I compared my analysis to Capablanca's uh, analysis. Wow. And that was a super, super interesting and very good exercise. So mm -hmm. I think that would be something as close to the optimal way of studying a book as you can get, uh, apart from having a coach where you can discuss the positions and things like that. But if you're studying on your own, I think that that would be my number one suggestion if you want to really maximize your learning. Mm -hmm. I get it. Thank you very much. And if you are talking about chess books, especially at influential chess books, because in a moment we'll be, let's say, talking about the specific titles, especially your favorite ones, I would like to ask you about the book that probably you have read, you have uh, you have heard about, and especially uh, I would like to know how much this book could help you. Uh, in a uh, chess development. I mean the book by uh, Chernev, Igor Chernev. Uh, it was the book Chess Move by Move, right? Um, Have you heard about such a book? Mm, sorry, no, Logical Chess. Logical, logical Chess yeah, Move yeah, by Move. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Logical Chess, sorry. I've, I've glanced through that book Irving uh, mm -hmm. a, few, a few years ago. Uh, mm -hmm. I haven't really read it. Um, I, I've heard it's a great book, uh, but I've heard, also heard that he has another book, uh, The Most Instructive Games Ever Played, or something like that, which some people think is even better. Uh, but 
I, I haven't really read these uh, firsthand, so so I can't really give you proper recommendations uh, about these books. But but they have a very good reputa reputation. Mm -hmm. uh, and Chernev overall is a good writer. I've read uh, a couple of other books by him, so so definitely worth looking at. Okay, got it. And what about your favorite books? I mean, especially the ones that make the biggest impact on you, because this would be yeah. pretty important to our audience, especially as our audience is something like about 1100 up to 16, 1700 leeches yeah. is the majority of players. Therefore, probably yeah. it would be pretty close to your level. Mm -hmm. the, the, this one definitely uh, is the one that had the greatest impact on, on my chess playing. Uh, Jeremy Solman's The Amateur Mind. Uh, uh, and he of course also has how to re reassess your chess mm -hmm. which is the same kind of book or, or not not the same kind of book but it, it's the same kind of message mm -hmm. uh, the imbalances ideas right mm -hmm. yeah the imbalances but he goes through them a lot more deeply more advanced examples he elaborates on it what i find fascinating about the amateur's mind is sort of the, the the whole foundation of the book i mean what what is done here is that he has played a number of training games against amateur players mm -hmm. and he has asked them to explain what they are thinking yeah and he's written this down and then he comments on what they say about the position uh whether or not they spot the important aspects of the position if they make the correct decisions based on uh, the observations that they made and so on and so so basically it's like okay you're saying this and this and this uh your flaws in your thinking is this and this and he points out the specific area that you can try to fix right exactly exactly mm -hmm. and and what's interesting is that he plays the same position with players of different strengths. Mm -hmm. So then you can show that, okay, so I had this 800 player who made this and this move, and then I have this 1200 player who made this move, which is a lot better. And this shows the difference in thinking between 800 and 1200 or 1600 or 2100. I mean, he has a lot of different levels. Mm -hmm. So I really think it, it's a great way to illustrate how players of different strengths think about uh, a position and another book that i really really love uh, which i read last year mm -hmm. which has sort of the same logic is this one. Oh, I think like a super grandmaster give me a second i'm back looks like yeah. i need to yeah. show the same the same one you have the same thing yeah, yeah. <laughs> and and, and th th this book is based on the same logic mm -hmm. so, so you have the same position is given to players of different levels. Yeah, excellent. And, uh, and the players are asked to describe their thinking process, describe which move they suggest that you play, and then assess w so we, who, which player has the advantage and mm -hmm. by how much. And you have example after example that, okay, so you have this player on, say, a 1400 level and then 1800, and then you a super grandmaster which is mickey adams in himself yeah who, who analyzes the positions and gi gives sort of the correct solution and also he analyzes the position with a computer mm -hmm. so uh, there are a few examples where he actually gets the problems wrong and, and that's also very educational that you see that even a super grandmaster with with a rating high above 2700 uh, can get some of these puzzles wrong uh, and, th and then there are exercises. I think there are something like 50 exercises in the book where you are asked to analyze the position, give, give a move or, or a sequence of moves uh, and an assessment of the position. It, it's super, super good. So uh, th this is a bit more advanced than, than Silman's books. Uh, so at, at least the amateur's mind. But if you're say above 1400, mm -hmm. I think this is really really great book and this is definitely useful for players up to master level and beyond mm -hmm. so those two books are definitely my 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 favorite and then there's another book that really made an impact on on my chess yeah uh, which is the art of attack oh the classics by the classic mm -hmm. and 
what what I've learned from this is basically the um, the classic bishop sacrifice mm -hmm. on h7. Uh, so, or, or the Greek gift, as it's also called at times. Uh, so that's just one example of, of the many plans that he, he describes. But after reading this book, I just, just know what to play for and how to set this up. And, and I've won numbers of games by sacrificing on h7 and then just knight g5 and checkmate or winning material. So great book. Uh, it's, it's, it's a bit limited in the sense that that you get a number of different attacking plans but you don't really get the overall understanding of chess that you do from other books like these strategic books mm -hmm. this is something uh, like a <clears throat> part that you are excelling at but it is not connected to the full chess if you can say that right exactly so, so you can you can get a number of sort of standardized plans that mm -hmm. you can apply but if you you but you need to get able, them, right? You need to reach yeah, them. Yeah, you need to get them. Mm -hmm. If your player counters them, then, then you really yes, need you're... to make up something else. Uh -huh. So, so it, it's kind of limited in that sense. But it's a really fun book and a lot of fun examples. And if you want to play aggressive chess, I think this is a really good, uh, good book. But also a bit more advanced. I, I think if you're 1100 you should probably wait a bit i think i guess it's for 1600 probably the best one because you need to have something like a visualization some like basic pattern and so on therefore when i was exactly. uh, a little bit uh, weaker when i studied this book at some point i would just simply stop reading this because it was over my head and it was something like uh, too much artificial because the biggest frustration over such books i mean not the specific one but this type that are over a, our our head is that you cannot apply the stuff that you were working on in practice immediately, right? It's not like, okay, maybe one out of, let's say, 100 games, I will have the, uh, let's say, Greek give, give, Greek give, give, gift sacrifice, right? And you're just yeah. like, when I am going to have this game? When, when, when? <laughs> exactly. So, but, but, but the thing is that if, if you study the, this book, you will find a number of different plans that you can sort of try to set up and try to make it work. Mm -hmm. uh, so you have something to play for, which is very, very concrete. Uh, so quite different from, say, what I talked about earlier about Silman's way of uh, trying to describe how you need to give the pieces potential. This is really setting up the position exactly like this. You know, you need to have a pawn on e5 to prevent the knight from coming to f6 if mm -hmm. you want to make the Greek gift work. Or you need to divert the, the, the uh, knight to the other side of the board or something. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so very specific in that way. But... Uh, if you want to have a good book for, say, 11, 1200s, which is sort of more fundamentals, I think this is a great choice. Oh, back excellent. To, back to basics, tactics. Dan Heisman, right? Dan Heisman, yes. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Uh, th this is a very typical uh, tactics book, I mm -hmm. think. Um, so you get a short description of tactical themes, say, mm -hmm. themes, viewers, forks, whatever. Uh, and a number of exercises and then um, annotated answers. I think this is a great way to learn sort of the building blocks of, of tactical chess. So I think having this book uh, in combination with something like, for instance, The Amateur's Mine mm -hmm. or, or um, say one's uh, winning chess strategies. I don't have that one right here at the moment. Yeah. But that, that's another strategy book which is really good at this level. So if you have those two parts, that one, yes. I think that that's the older version, but but yeah, definitely really, really good. The book. Winning so, Chess series, by the way, Winning Chess series, right? Because it's the yeah. series of the books and there is the yes. play, Winning Chess strategy, tactics, uh, uh, B brilliances, end games, openings, and endings. There are six in the exactly. series. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I, I haven't read them all. I, I've read the strategy book, mm -hmm. uh, and I, I think it's really, really excellent. It's basically the same content as what Silman explains. I mean, I mean Silman is co-author of the book, mm -hmm. also, but he, he's not accredited that much. But, yeah. But uh, but it, it's sort of the same thing that Sarawan explains. So, how to make your pieces work well, mm -hmm. how to make sure your knights have good squares to go to, how to make sure your bishops have good diagonals, uh, how to use your pawns, how to use your rooks, and so on and so on. Uh, so, if you have those two things, I mean, 
the strategy, the tactics, then you're really good to go. So you don't need to have 40, 50 books. Absolutely. To, to get you going. I mean, two, three, then you're, you're set, basically. And especially if you have the two or three books that you are reading, right? Not sitting on exactly. the shelf. Exactly. <laughs> the books that are sitting on the shelf, they do nothing. Uh -huh. uh, and, and I think we all tend to fall into this trap, or at least a lot of us uh -huh. want to find the best book. Yeah, you and know, I will just read. buy another one because this yeah. one was very good, but there is another one in the market that is absolutely the best. And yeah, the process yeah, yeah. is uh, continuing into yeah. infinity, right? <laughs> exactly. I don't know why it's like that. I know. Yeah. I mean, it's sort of a disease in the chess community, I think. Mm -hmm. We want to find the best books. I, it's something like There's searching for ho holy grail, right? Exactly. Searching for holy grail. The but final, I will find it and I'll become a master. Yeah, uh -huh. exactly. It's just about finding the right one. Mm -hmm. If I have a book, I bought this one. It didn't make me a master. It's the wrong one. I need to buy the next one. Mm -hmm. so, uh, I think another one that's that's sort of uh, along the same path is this one. The mm -hmm. Power of Pawns should not be confused by Pawn Power in Chess, which is a different book. Mm -hmm. of Pawns by Jörg Pickel, German, um, I think he's a Grandmaster, yes. Yeah, he's probably a Grandmaster. Mm -hmm. uh, really gives you the basics for how to set up your pawns to make the pieces work well. So it's easy to think that a book about pawns is only about pawns, but it's really not about pawns, really. Uh, it's about placing the pawns in squares or in formations that make the pieces work well. Mm -hmm. Coordination of so, the pieces with pawns in the background, right? Exactly. So, mm -hmm. so this is the same kind of book as say Ron's book or uh, Silman's book. Uh, it, it's really a basic strategy book, which gives you the foundations for how to set up the game. So this is also an excellent choice if you're starting out, I think players in the range that you described, L1 mm -hmm. to 1600, great choice, really great. It's quite a thin book. Uh, it has less than 200 pages, mm -hmm. so so really, really good value for money. Okay. And you don't have to spend five years studying this book in order to get something out of it. Mm -hmm. I mean, a few months and then you know, a few weeks even. Yeah, de depending on the pace you are reading, right? Because this is pretty important of as well. Course. Mm -hmm. of course. Okay, let's get. Yeah. No, an another one that mm -hmm. I want, really want to mention is I, I had a, had a situation a couple of years ago where I really tried to structure my um, my study and try to be really disciplined and play uh, or or work through basic tactics systematically every day, do a set number and really work hard mm -hmm. and it killed my motivation really uh, and I, I was just so fed up with chess I had to take a break for mm -hmm. one month yeah. and then I just picked up a book that looked kind of fun mm -hmm. uh, on the cover yeah. this one. Oh, on the by the way I, I have it give me a second Explain. Justin, why did you take the books from my shelf? Justin, why do you do it? <laughs> <laughs> By the way, we have in our community, we have studied these books, uh, sorry, these uh, games in the in the book and they were perfectly. Many of our audience were pretty much happy because the, the miniatures are great with the value, with the ideas, and they are from va va various type of, uh, let's say, tournaments, events and so on, and with various uh, hi historical events. And therefore, they were pretty much very, very hyped about this uh, miniatures. And then some like, Pinker teacher, give us more, give us more. <laughs> yeah, great, great. Uh -huh. uh, the, the reason why I picked it up, I, I don't really rem remember why I bought it from the first beginning, but but I, I thought it, it looks like a fun book. It's mm -hmm. quite thin. Yeah, and Once it again, it has... 120 something pages. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I thought, that, okay, this is going to be a light read. I can take a look at this and see mm -hmm. if it's something. And this really re sparked my interest in chess. Yeah. Uh, because the games are very short. Mm -hmm. uh, the way I study with without a board, it's really great because there are plenty of diagrams uh and great annotations yeah the annotations are perfect i would say because the yeah. the quality of the text and the quality of understanding provided by the offer is 
absolutely amazing. Yeah, mm -hmm. and the games are super fun. Yeah, the I games think, are awesome. And, and, and that's the thing, that they, they are tiny explosions mm -hmm. of just mm -hmm. chess beauty. Yeah. So, so that really got me back and got me motivated to, to work more with my chess. Uh, and uh, yeah, I think it's really, really great. And they, this is something that it, it doesn't really require any particular level. Yeah. Uh, of course, you need to be able to understand how the pieces move and why certain moves are played and so on. But, but a player of 1100 or even 800 should be able to make sense of this book. Mm -hmm. And even master level players should be able to enjoy this because the games are super fun to, yeah. to uh, look uh, So I think this is... It, it has a lot of educational content, a, a lot of good instruction, but most of all it's really fun and let's face it i mean we're, we're not going to be chess professionals at least not professional players yeah we're doing this for fun for enjoyment mm -hmm. so so books like these are really really valuable to absolutely to maintain the fun so so um, i think yeah it's mm -hmm. really, really good. and by the way we were working on uh, logical chess move by move by Irvin Chernev and after that probably two weeks uh, after that I just uh, let's say told my audience that I'm going to show them the instructive chess miniatures and they were some like oh my goodness it's a uh, great because the uh, let's say logical chess move by move gave us the fundamentals about understanding some like a little bit of s s similar to Silman and now we are just having the fun because we understand the ideas we see the mistakes and we see how it is exploited and therefore some like yeah. it sparked the interest even more yeah, mm -hmm. perfect. I, th I think that's that's a really good point that that you want to, in order to to uh, sort of maximize your chess experience, not only the, the sort of learning and, and development, mm -hmm. which is sometimes, at least in my opinion, it's it's overemphasized that you need to improve continuously. Well, enjoy the game. That's that's the point. That should be Absolutely. your goal to to keep it fun, to keep it interesting, to have an enjoyment, to to be able to appreciate, to feel the joy, to feel the joy. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> that's what it's all about. Uh huh. So, so if you're stuck at fourteen hundred for the rest of your life, okay. As long as you are enjoying this, is perfectly fine, right? Exactly. Mm hmm. If I can add one more thing, many times uh, my audience asks me because I have been playing chess for. 25 years already, but for the last uh, four years, I stopped playing over the board classical games, just classical. And many times I have the questions why I do not longer play classical or word over the games. And I told, uh, even today, because I was streaming a few, few, years, a few years ago, I told my audience that now I do not feel the drive, I do not feel the joy to play classical over the board games. But I feel the joy about teaching chess, about showing chess, about sharing ideas, about making the interaction, interaction, and I just make the comparison that I rather would like to prepare five hour stream, inviting you, inviting other guests, talking about chess, showing the analysis, the game, so on, for five hours, than having five over the board chess tournaments that would be for free with all of the equipment, all of the fee, all of the stuff. I just uh, want to have the five hour stream because I do not longer fear the joy, but I feel a huge joy about showing, about analyzing, about helping, about all of this stuff, but except chess over the board classical games. And therefore it's great that we have such a beautiful community and beautiful chess world that everybody can have uh, their own pieces that can enjoy, right? Exactly. Mm -hmm. and I, I've had a similar transition now. I, I, haven't, I haven't really played seriously for that long. Uh, but what, what I've discovered is that throughout the process of reading all the chess books that I've read and reviewed on my blog, uh, I, I've realized, realized about myself that I find more inspiration and appreciation in reading chess books than actually playing. Mm -hmm. So I, I think I've found myself having an identity as a sort of chess academic or chess book uh, reader. Maybe, I, maybe I'll just reveal the secret because probably you are a little bit too shy. Our friend uh, Dr. Patzer, our friend uh, Justin, is the chess book lover because we are in the group chess book collectors, therefore we can reveal the secret. And we love chess books and sometimes we are laughing because we are just making the inside jokes that if somebody is asking about uh, 
has anybody read that book we are we are just making the fun that it is not the book for not the group for reading but the group for collecting the books and we are just making the uh, threat that if you are just ask again if somebody read the book we'll just uh, expel you from the book because we are just collecting the books not reading <laughs> and i think a lot of people are in that category actually just collecting a number of books mm -hmm. not really reading many of them yeah so, but, but I, I, I found big joy in reading good chess books. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of bad chess books as well. Uh, I'm not going to talk too much about those, but but um, yeah, focus yeah. on the good ones. Let yeah, and the bad ones go. And especially, I just uh, I just pasted the link, guys, for our friend to uh, his uh, blog because uh, uh, our friend Justin just publishes the reviews. We'll be talking in a moment about the reviews and the blog is uh, the link to the blog is uh, on the chat. I'm just painting once in a while. And now let's get a little bit about uh, just the reviews that we are talking about. Of course, in the meantime, if you would like to present some of the books that you really like, you would like to recommend, feel free to do so. It's it's not a problem. Let's talk about chess, re chess reviews and your blog because this is the topic that I would like to address. Uh, when did you start to, let's say, put the content about the chess books reviews on your blog? And what was the idea behind it? Because you just mentioned that you would like to put, put that as the expression form, if I can say it. But what was the, let's say, the decision that to say, okay, I'll be continuing that. Why I'm just putting this into, into the topic? Because many uh, chess bloggers, general bloggers, just have some, such a phase that they are just publishing something for, let's say, a few months. And after that, they quit completely, right? Because they do not feel the drive, if I can say it. And what makes you to make this process pretty much continuously? And how, how long have you been doing this? If you can just give us the insight, it would be great. Yeah. Uh, I, as I said before, I think I started some, somewhere around 2019. Mm -hmm. um, and the, the, the whole idea was that I had to start reading the books that I actually bought. I, invested a lot of money in mm -hmm. the books that I have on my shelf and I haven't really read them. And how can I do that in a structured way? How can I make sure that I actually read them? Mm -hmm. And I thought that if I present this to the outside world, there's an expectation that I will continue doing so. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I, I really gave that sort of expectation to myself to, uh, to sort of give myself some pressure. You wanted to be accountable, read. right? Yes. that you are providing yes. the value but at the same time you're showing the love is that correct uh, exactly mm -hmm. exactly so so the the purpose of the blog has never really been to provide content to people mm -hmm. it's, it's really been more about me but the content to the people to the readers is sort of an added bonus because mm -hmm. that sort of comes automatically but it's really about putting the pressure on myself to actually read the books to and the driving force in the beginning was to help me improve as a player. Uh, but over the years, I've sort of grown more to the, to the side of just reading for enjoyment. Mm -hmm. and the progress like, was not the priority, right? No, mm -hmm. not anymore as such. Yeah, yeah. Uh, in the beginning, I, I had a very clear goal. I wanted to reach 2000. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, that, that was my goal, 2000 classical. Mm -hmm. uh, you mean 2000 classical over the board, ELO, the yes. ELO rating? Yes. Ooh, yes. very yeah. challenging. Very challenging. Yeah, yeah, yes. very. Uh, and my first rating was, uh, first official rating was, I think, 1480 or something like that. Mm -hmm. And now it's something like 1510 or some around 1510, so, uh, your national rating or ELO? My ELO. Your ELO, okay, got it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so, so basically, my, my progress has been very, very small mm -hmm. uh, in terms of rating. But then, on the other hand, I, I don't play so many over-the-board games. So, it's it would actually be mathematically impossible for me to reach that goal mm -hmm. uh, because uh, I don't play enough games. But uh, over the years, I found that okay, I don't care if my rating is twelve hundred or if it's eighteen hundred. It doesn't really matter. I want to feel that I get something out of playing, mm -hmm. that I get, that I develop as a player, that I feel that my understanding of chess increases, yeah. uh, that I'm able to appreciate uh, the game more mm -hmm. while playing, while watching streams, analysis online, while reading books. Uh, and I really feel that I've developed, definitely. 
so my chess knowledge at least has has uh, increased dramatically uh, but my rating hasn't really reflected that as much but I I recently or the last over the board game I played I played against a player who was almost 1800 and I crushed him completely Whoa. so that that was a real real confidence boost that mm -hmm. okay so if if I can can win against a player of that caliber then I think maybe I'm sort of close to that level of understanding at least and that skill level of playing although my 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 actually actual rating is much lower mm -hmm. uh, no so so um, as I said uh, at first it was about improvement but now it's more about reading books about finding good books that I enjoy trying to um, yeah, re really find the gems in, in sort of the, the vast world of chess books. Yeah. Um, so, and it's a big challenge. There are a lot of great books out there. Yeah, got it. Okay, and now let's go into the next topic because it's connected to the chess book reviews. I, I am having the specific technical one because of course everybody knows about the books, about the blogs and so on. But I am pretty curious because I, I have been, uh, let's say running chess blog as well for 10 years, but with the breaks uh, recently, but it was in Polish, by the way, not in English. I would like to ask you how much time you needed to devote to make the book review. For example, I'm just giving you the oversight, over overview. You are just buying the book, after that, you just receive the book, and from this moment up to publishing the review, how much time, most often in average, is something like devoted, right? Uh, well. There, there, there are two different things. The time from when I'm buying the book until I'm publishing, that's usually three years. <laughs> mm -hmm. But but that doesn't mean that I work with the book for that number of time because uh, I have several books in my shelf that have been sitting there for many years uh, without even opening them. Uh, so usually when I read a book, depending on how big it is, how advanced it is, how difficult it is, it takes me about one month of reading, digesting, sort of trying to structure mm -hmm. my thoughts around the books and trying to condense that into a review. Mm -hmm. uh, so that, that's so. So writing the review itself usually takes just a few hours, maybe say three or four hours to write mm -hmm. uh, one review. Yeah, but I write it in my head while mm -hmm. I'm reading and I'm sort of noting it. Oh, this is an interesting example. And oh, this this uh, quote I want to, to put really into the blog. Uh -huh. Yeah, so I, I take photos with my my uh, my phone or I sometimes I highlight in the book or, or whatever. So I really try to sort of piece it together while working through the book, depending on what kind of book it is. Uh, some books are uh, sort of like textbooks mm -hmm. uh, so if you take um, one great example like this one mm -hmm. under the surface yeah I think this m might be over the head for most of your your audience here if they're up to 1600 yeah uh, but this this is a really great book uh, if you're slightly more advanced but this is one of those books that it's it ha has a lot of text um, so a lot of annotations uh, a lot to read uh, and oops, so so that's a different kind of book, say compared to another equally great but completely different book like Learn Chess Tactics by John Mann. Mm -hmm. It's more of a workbook that you you have a number of different problems, problems find a solution, and then you find you can read Mann's solution it, in the end. I mean. Though you would approach those books completely differently. Uh, one is more about reading, digesting the material, thinking about the game, and the other one is just calculate and try to find the correct tactics. Mm -hmm. Very, very different books, but usually it takes about the same amount of time. One, one month, give or take. Okay. Uh, Okay, thank you very much, because I, I, I wanted to, um, let's say, make you to answer this question, not just because of my inner curiosity, partially yes, but most often the time 
that people sometimes are complaining, oh, this review is not that much uh, valuable, this is too short, too long, there are not that many versions on, but they have completely no idea how much energy it drains to make such a coherent, valuable and beneficial review for the audience. And of course, you cannot, uh, let's say, make everybody happy, right? Because some people would like to have a very long, some people very short. Some people would like yeah. to have 15 diagrams, some of those have just no more than two, right? And now you need yeah. to make some kind of balance to provide the stuff that would be universal, if I can say that. And by the way, many times when I was looking for the book interview before I wanted to read the books, guess which blog I uh, find out to, to see if the book is good or not. Great. Yes, year one. That's why and, and, I'm, and, I'm and pretty I mean, happy that, that you have it. Uh -huh. Yeah, and that, that's one of the, the things that I try to do. I, I try to write the reviews in a way to make you able to decide, is this book for me or not? Mm -hmm. Uh, is this a good, good book for my level, for what I'm trying to achieve, uh, and so on. So I'm not trying to give sort of the universal description of this is the best book in this category or whatever. I, I try to make it sort of contextual. So if you're a player of this level, if you're trying to improve in this area, mm -hmm. then this might be a good book or this is not a good book yeah. maybe in, in some cases. Uh, so, so that's really how I try to frame it. And my inspiration came from, um, uh, from the beginning, came from John Hartman, uh, who is now the editor of uh, Chess Life magazine. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I heard, I think it was his first interview on uh, the Perpetual Chess uh, podcast. Ben Johnson. <laughs> yeah, all of the family right here. Uh -huh. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Uh, and, and he talked about this, that, that most of the chess book reviews are by grandmasters mm -hmm. and they are written for masters and then all of the books are sort of evaluated based on the criteria if they're good for a grandmaster or in, I am. Definitely. And I, th I think that's, uh, that's really not the biggest audience. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you look at the bulk of players, they're around somewhere between 1200 to 2000 that's mm -hmm. that's the huge mass of players. yeah but depending on the server depending on the pool that we are uh, thinking about it is some like 13 to 1500 is the average but no more than yeah. 1500 and therefore the majority let's say 90 percent of the players are in the range of six or seven hundred if you're just starting out yeah. up to let's say 17 1800 right because exactly. for example if I, if I am 2200 at leeches sometimes 2300 depending on the rating and i am in the one percentile, right? Therefore, 99% of players, if I would like to present the material at such high level, for example, that I will be suffering or struggling, they would be pre-clicking over, over via head, right? And that's why yeah. I just put the shift into the lower category to make them more accessible. That's from my standpoint, exactly. by the way. Mm -hmm. So, so and, and that's the same perspective that I have. That okay, writing for grandmaster or I am strength players it it makes no sense yeah I'm not qualified to to assess the books based on that so mm -hmm. but but I try to write the reviews based on my experience since I'm a fairly average player mm -hmm. uh, give or take uh, I think that my views would be somewhat representative of, of sort of big majority of chess players mm -hmm. so, so that's where I'm coming from and that's what I'm sort of trying to do with my reviews Okay, thank you very much. And now let's get into the next question about the no, next topic, because we have already that question from our friend from the chat, our friend K. Grex. He asked you about how to keep getting discouraged when you hit a plateau, because we are getting into the topic of chess progress and chess improvement. And the first question, one more time, how to keep from getting discouraged when you hit a plateau, because probably you hit a few times. Yeah, I, mm -hmm. I think uh, if you want to define, uh, as I said, um, my rating has been more or less flatlined for the last five years. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so per definition, I'm at the plateau and have been for a long time. But uh, in terms of my chest understanding, in mm -hmm. terms of my chest development, I'm sort of feeling that I'm increasing. I don't know. I, I don't have really the objective values. You do not have the indicators, right? If you just no, make the no, mathematical one, right? Mm -hmm. but, but, but I think it's... Uh, the way to get around that and to to avoid getting discouraged mm -hmm. is really to focus on the long-term goal and that's 
whether it's a rating or if it's enjoyment or whatever just ha have the bigger picture uh, don't focus on oh i had this horrible tournament i lost yeah. 10 points i'm going the wrong way okay so what maybe you had some very interesting games you maybe got a great position where you actually played better than you used to but then you blundered your queen and then you lost the game but then you can learn something from that and so so i think it's really all about the attitude or the approach that you have to it that have a sort of growth mindset uh, as they say uh, to think about how can i make my experience better uh, what can I learn from my recent games? How can I enjoy the game more? Uh, things like that. So, so don't focus too much about rating because rating is just a number. Mm -hmm. it's really, not. It's not your identity. Maybe I'll Some just put say, one. I'm a, I'm a 1500. I'm an 1800. Yeah. I'm a whatever. It, it's not who you are. Mm -hmm. It doesn't define you. It doesn't define exactly. you. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Don't let it define you. I think yeah. that's, that's, that should be the main message. That You shouldn't let the number be uh, a proxy for your identity because that's really a recipe for disaster. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much. And another question, if I can ask about chess improvement and chess progress, what make you the most frustrated and more depressed? I know it's pretty difficult, but probably it would be helpful for our community as well. Whenever you wanted to grind for the high rating, I mean, the, the goal that you that you just mentioned, 2000 ELO, is very, very challenging. For me, it's, it's unattainable. Therefore, I'm just pretty honest about it. What make you frustrated and made you depressed whenever you are just grinding pretty much very, very, let's say, hard and you you cannot let's say make some like a visible explosion right if i can use this metaphor mm -hmm. yeah i what helped you to overcome it maybe right put it a little bit I, more what helped I you to overcome this let's say uh, deep downs yeah i i think maybe i my personality uh, has made me not really fall into those dips at all because i've always had the sort of long-term view i've always had long-term goal of mm -hmm. can, can you say that you had the uh, growth mindset the the yeah. one right from the beginning mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. so so the short-term development is really not interesting for me so if i lose a game then okay that stings of course but that's not really i i can let that go and just move on uh so that's really a personality thing so i i have never really struggled with that with the uh, sort of depression of losing rating points and and not having the development that I feel I should have mm -hmm. um, mostly because I think I don't focus that much on the rating itself got it I focus on the games I focus to on uh, being able to uh, give challenges to stronger players to so regardless of my rating I mm -hmm. want to be able to Okay, so now I played an even game against the 1600. Next time I'm going to play an even game against the 1700 or an 1800 or mm -hmm. whatever. And and even try to beat them. Yeah. Uh, so that's sort of how I think about it. That, okay, so I played this player who's much stronger than me. The next time I will think like this and this and this and try to sort of get even better. Mm -hmm. Regardless of win or lose, it doesn't really Regardless matter. of the outcome, right? This is the key. Yeah. Mm -hmm exactly so so process goals mm -hmm. uh, and long-term view growth mindset all of that it sounds a bit cliche but but I, I think it's really really important uh, if improvement is important to you mm -hmm. uh, but improvement doesn't have to be important mm -hmm. as, as I said before enjoyment and love of the game is equally important I think mm -hmm. uh, so you can stay at 1100 for the rest of your life That's yeah perfectly fine i mean 1100 that's about sort of the average level so so then you're better than probably 40 percent of all the chess players mm -hmm. so that's a, that's a quite decent level right there yeah and so i would it's, yeah yeah i would about that. i would even add that uh it is even more because of course you are presented excellent when that's why i'm so happy that i invite you into the conversation the, the interview because i knew your uh, let's say uh, approach about that and i would even add that there is no point of comparing ourselves to others because we are unique and right and it doesn't matter as long as we are not having the uh, ne necessity to, to live out of chess by playing 
right? Because if you are the chess professionals, it's completely different, right? All of the rating points, all of the changes, all of the novelties, all this stuff, but it is completely different world, right? But as long as we are amateurs with the, let's say, purest definition of this word, we should enjoy, we should try to have fun, we should try to share, we should try to keep it, right? Because there are various uh, types of activities. And at the same time, you just mentioned that improvement uh, doesn't need to be the only goal. I would even say a little bit extended version. It can be many goals that are fulfilling to us as long as we are defining this, we are choosing them and we are feeling happy with this. What about that? Yeah, I couldn't have said it better. Okay, okay, thank you very much. And now uh, let's go for the next one because we have a few more questions before we are just uh, wrapping up the, uh, let's say, interview. What about uh, a little bit, uh, what about talking a little bit about chess media? Because of course, chess block is one of the form of expressing ourselves. But if you're just talking uh, a, li a little bit about chess Twitter, because at Twitter there are the people who are talking about chess and there are various uh, content creators and so on. How could you, let's say, get us a little bit of insight? What is going on at the uh, chess community at Twitter and what are the let's say pros and cons about being there or not being there yeah I, I think chess Twitter is a really really interesting thing um, so a few years ago um, this chess punks thing mm -hmm. started uh, so we were I think we were 10, 10 people who had some sort of semi um, frequent interaction on, on Twitter mm -hmm. and someone suggested that we should have a hashtag yeah um, because we shared the positions problems here here's my latest game from this in this tournament and uh, then we arrived at this chess punks uh, hashtag and I, th I think that was launched something sometime around 19 maybe 20 I don't I don't really remember. Probably I four years ago, I guess. Four or five years ago. It's, it's, it's that many years ago. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a little, a little uh, bit. Time flies. Yeah, time, time flies. flies very quickly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but, but it's, it's really interesting how that sort of tight, tiny little group of people has now grown to hundreds of people who mm -hmm. are sort of to, to tag their, their tweets and try to interact with other people. And I think it's been a really amazing journey that it, it's been so positive all, all the way. People are just super supportive. They're posting uh, games and if, okay, so I lost this game and then you get some support and oh, that's too bad and uh, you, you'll get them next time. Mm -hmm. You get all these positive comments or if you win, then yeah, hooray. So, so a lot of great support and love. Uh, I, I think it's just, a, a wonderful community. Yeah, I'm, I'm so thankful to be a part of that. Uh, so that for me is the main reason why I use Twitter because we ha we have this community and there's so much love in in the chess punks community. So it's mm -hmm. great. Um, but in terms of social media and chess media in in general, I'm I'm not really that into it. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm not trying to really um, promote myself as content creator like many other people are mm -hmm. with trying to sort of marketing in my blog and so on I, I'm writing mostly for myself uh, I've I tried a couple can of we say ago. that you are writing the blog something like a chess diary is it something like that so, sort of like that mm -hmm. yeah uh, and if people benefit from that that's great mm -hmm. but, I, I tried a, a couple of years ago adding some um, some advertisements. I thought maybe I can make a bit of money of this, mm -hmm. but th then I was just annoyed w whenever I got, went onto the page myself and yeah. there were just ads everywhere. And I was ah, I can't it was flooding it, right? the screen, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I was I just oh remove that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was almost going to say something obscene, but uh, yeah, <laughs> I, I was re really really upset with that. Uh -huh. And and I I have a Patreon profile uh i i think i have three supporters not much but it's it's not the point it's mm -hmm. not what i'm trying to do so i i don't try to promote this i've been thinking maybe i should have a youtube site and then I'm like, nah. why should i have that mm -hmm. because that's not really the goal that's not what i'm trying to do i i want to read chess books for enjoyment mm -hmm. and i want to as i said keep myself accountable yeah and also to to sort of spread the word about the books that I enjoy mm -hmm. uh, sort of just 
give it out to whoever feels um, that there's a value in that yeah so that's really the point so so i think that uh, I'm, I'm not really the the right person to uh, to speak about sort of chess media and how to strategize around social media and things like that. Mm -hmm. I um, I rather I rather meant that chess media about Twitter because I know yeah. that you are using the Twitter because if you are just clicking on your blog there is the Twitter right side at the let's say okay. sidebar and therefore I knew that you use Twitter yeah. because I'm not in the Twitter but the guru Neil Bruce because probably you know about chess punks this is the most popular one I I am just calling him a ten years uh, plan guru right I need mm -hmm. to get into the uh, into into the touch into touch with Neil Bruce because I. I would like him to share the idea about his plan about the men with the scissors right because some some yeah. people are just making fun about the scissors and that's why uh, whenever i uh, hear, hear about chess punks i am pretty happy because i know that you are i mean you as the group are not uh, let's say focused on the financial level but rather focused about the joy about sharing the uh, ideas sharing uh, some of the interesting stuff and supporting each other it is something like a exactly. purity right pure pure enjoyment Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and and that's quite interesting that you mentioned Neil because I think he has a similar approach to the chess content mm -hmm. that he puts out as I have. Yeah, but he, he started out just he he wanted to he has this never again game that he he's mm -hmm. posted on Twitter. I think he ha posts it uh, once a year as sort of an anniversary. Yeah, it, it's it's one of those games where he made a horrible blunder and he said. I'm never going to make that mistake again, so I'm going to study my basic tactics mm -hmm. until I know everything. And then he's made, I think, 10,000 flashcards. Yeah, yeah, he's obsessed, by the way. That's why yeah. I want to and, have him. <laughs> and the thing is, he, he's just shared his journey. Yeah. His experience of doing this. And the joy, know, and the joy. The joy, uh -huh. yeah. Uh, and also, I think, the sort of frustration of, of doing this. and. I, I had uh, um, uh, an exchange with him and we, we wrote in a, uh, in a chat mm -hmm. uh, and I, I asked him about this process, wh whether he felt that this was enjoyable and how he works with this to sort of keep his motivation on. And he, he said that he, he, there's an American commercial that was many years ago where where there, this man, he got out uh, of bed in the morning and he went to make donuts. Mm -hmm. And every morning, 4 p.m., 4 a.m. No matter what he happens, went, he needs to go yeah, there. Mm -hmm. He goes and he makes the donuts. Uh -huh. and, and that's Neil's approach to doing chess tactics. That, mm -hmm. Okay, I'm going to make the donuts. Yeah. <laughs> just, just going to do the work. Uh -huh. And I tried this approach and that was what, we, as I said before, it really killed my motivation. Mm -hmm. so, we're completely different on that. Yeah, level. nobody is I the need, same. I, I need to keep it fun. Mm -hmm. Neil, Neil is super structured, very disciplined, yeah. very focused on on really doing the work. Mm -hmm. Whereas I'm more lazy, I think. Yeah, and even though I, I can just uh, reveal the secret, if this is the secret, that Neil himself call him the grinder, right? He's just yeah. grinding that, no matter if it's exactly. pleasure or not, but he's grinding that and having the goal and he's going into the goal no matter what happens, right? Exactly. Yeah, mm -hmm. and that's how you get through 10,000 uh, tactics puzzles again and again. Mm -hmm. It's not just doing them once, it's doing them repeatedly. Yeah. It's a sort of woodpecker-ish method. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's, it's really, really, um, really fascinating and really inspirational. Uh, but it's not my cup of tea. Yeah, it's, of course. Everybody is different. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I fully is. support that. Yes, completely agree with it. What about talking about just briefly about chess uh, Twitch and chess YouTube? Do you have your favorite chess content creators? You are, are you watching chess Twitch? Are you watching chess YouTube? What about that? I'm not so big on Twitch. Uh, the Twitch content that I look at is usually something that they sort of post on YouTube. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, I, I think I probably have the same go-to channels on YouTube as more or less e everyone else. Mm -hmm. uh, Coach Andras. Yeah, like Andras stuff. Uh, mm -hmm. he, yeah, he's really, really great. Uh, John Bartholomew, definitely yeah. a lot of great content. Uh, and I, I cannot go, I would be wrong to not mention uh, the person who sort of 
was the first uh, YouTube channel that I watched in terms of chess, and that's the Chess Network. Chess Network, Jerry, of course. Jerry, yeah. mm -hmm. uh, I spent many, many hours watching his videos. Uh, a lot of fun, mm -hmm. uh, really, really great content. But I, I think his approach is a bit old school. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think if you look at Andres and John Bartholomew, I think they have more sort of modern modern approach. approach. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, more accessible, more more uh, easily digestible uh, approach. I think mm -hmm. a bit more fun, maybe. But but uh, yeah, really really great. Yeah, but, but everybody is, is so, great. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, there are so many good content creators. Uh, Anna Kramling mm -hmm. uh, is also great. I watched the video uh, this morning where she uh, had her mother Pia. Kramling, yeah, it was friend, amazing. Uh, <laughs> played the chess hustler that, uh, that he taught her the moves right all of the yeah. center of development. It was amazing. Yeah. yeah. And, oh, that's amazing. Uh, uh -huh. Yeah. So, so there's so much to choose from now. Mm -hmm. um, when I started watching uh, chess videos on on YouTube, there, I think, I, I mean, Jerry was the big one. Mm -hmm. Chess Network. Yeah. He, it, it, he was the biggest by far. And uh, back then, when there were not that many creators, right? Because yeah, ten years ago, he was many. one of the only, let's say, free, right? But yeah, nowadays, yeah. there are let's say fifty, right? At least. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, so we have such a lux luxury these these days that there are so many many good content creators. Mm -hmm. uh, so, it's really just finding your preference, finding yeah. someone you resonate with, someone who has sort of the type of content that mm -hmm. you like and and the level that you're at. Uh, I'm, so, I mean, you can and probably that. someone that you feel the chemistry, right? So called yeah, chemistry yeah, that you feel yeah. that feel the stuff, right? Mm -hmm. I think that's important that you that you feel that okay, so we we're sort of connected. We are on the same length, one, right? On yeah, the same waves. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Let's go with the one more question about uh, let's say stuff, and it will be wrapping up in ten minutes. Is that okay? Yeah. Just sure. just two 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 three uh, short questions. But the first one that I'm pretty curious is just chess broadcasts. I mean chess broadcasts related to the tournaments on all of the important events that uh, are broadcasted by many many various streamers, but especially about chesscom and Liches and various content creators. What about that? Do you watch it? And if you watch it, are you pretty much more enjoying the stuff or maybe looking this a little bit from perspective? What can I get into my game to get better? Or maybe both? How could you treat that and how much you consume it, if I can ask? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I haven't really watched a lot of um, the sort of normal streams. Mm -hmm. uh, what, what I've been I've, I've been watching the, the big events, the, the World Championships uh, and uh, things like that. Uh, and I have the luxury of being native Norwegian. Mm -hmm. I, I, I can watch Norwegian TV and understand what they're saying. And you can understand and what Magnus is doing, even if you do not understand. <laughs> well, well, not necessarily what he's doing, but uh, Norwegian TV has, they have such a great, great production. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, it, it's by far the best one, uh, not in terms of the level of chess, yeah. but in terms of entertainment and making the, uh, the chess accessible to people in the general public so I, I mean i have even my my whole family is watching chess when when magnus is playing and they're not chess players mm -hmm. but they're they're watching it they're appreciating it they're seeing this graph the, the evaluation oh no it's a big advantage for white oh but they have no idea what's going on mm -hmm. <laughs> but they hear the commentary and uh, it's it's really really great. So so whenever there's there's a big event like this and Norwegian TV has coverage, then we're we're watching that. Uh, and I'm watching with my wife. She's not a chess player either. And she you're just celebrating something like right? Yeah, yeah. Oh, excellent! It's like watching a soccer game. Oh, that's what I want to know. Huh? It, it's sort of that entertainment. You you're watching it's fun and then sort of you can sit with your cup of coffee and just enjoying it. Wow. And and I remember, I don't. I think it was maybe the uh, the championship uh, or the the match against Ma Karyakin, I think. The World Championship uh, three years ago. Yeah, mm -hmm. where where 
I, I was watching the uh, Norwegian broad broadcast and then I, I thought, oh, I'm just going to check out what, what's happening on the official broadcast mm -hmm. on, on, a, on the feed, the web, web page or whichever page they had. And I, I watched it for two minutes and was, it's so boring because they're just sitting there and, and sort of brabbling variations like okay so knight to f3 and then takes takes and then not accessible for for enjoyment no, right no, no, no. Mm -hmm. and it, you have two or three grandmasters just sitting there analyzing the game and it's just like yeah okay i'm watching something else yeah so i'll just like, switch into another channel mm -hmm. yeah so, yeah so it, it really depends on what you want to to achieve so so i've i've just like with the chess books i'm trying to consume the chess content more for enjoyment mm -hmm. than for educational value okay but, but uh, i think if you want to learn a lot then then maybe the these broadcasts from say chess.com or i don't even know if chess 24 has coverage anymore but by the way now it's it's integrated because, into chesscom yeah, because chesscom just bought right, all of this they, mm -hmm. they bought it. Yeah, yeah yeah so it's the same but but either way if you want to learn something then having a grandmaster sitting there live annotating a game that's really educational but it's not necessarily fun mm -hmm. <laughs> okay okay got it thank you very much yeah. and one more question especially the one because yeah, i just met you because you you didn't know about me unless i just ask you about the interview thank you very much for accepting the invitation by the way uh, i just listened to the podcast about chess journey with our friend dr kevin skull and i was some like fascinated because you were so much into chess even if if i knew that you are not going to get very far i mean the, that far that you wanted to to get there because it's very very difficult i would say most of an impossible Possible for some kind of let's say uh, rare exceptions and I was some like fascinated by your uh, let's say joy about chess and I was something like that oh it would be great if I could ever make the interview with you especially as I love podcasts and what about you what what, uh, what do you feel about the podcast as the sharing the idea especially there are nowadays many many podcasts uh, that are related to improvement right all do chess improvement and the like but in general sense the podcasts are the new media right because let's say 10 years ago before uh, let's even six six years ago before ben johnson the father of chess podcast perpetual chess podcast stuff even before he just did that it was some like the uh, empty space that nobody just organized and nowadays yeah. there are at least eight to ten podcasters that are producing really nice content what do you think about this form and which one do you enjoy especially maybe some titles if you wish mm -hmm. yeah go on of course of course i i listen frequently to to ben's podcast i i listen to more or less every episode that he's made mm -hmm. uh, throughout the years I, I started listening i think it was about six months after the po podcast had launched i uh, after the first one after the yeah, episode after the first one, yeah wow excellent then, then I, saw, I i it was just just random that I, I was sort of thinking that hmm is there a chess podcast mm -hmm. i searched for it and i found his podcast and i started listening nice That's more or less from the beginning uh so i enjoy that i think uh, his content is great yeah great interviews i love his book reviews of mm -hmm. um, he's an amazing guy amazing yeah amazing. Uh, apart from that, I listen often to the Chess Fields podcast mm -hmm. uh, with JJ and Julia. Yeah, JJ Lang. Uh, de def definitely high quality as well, but completely different. Yeah, different genre and different type of content. They are just laughing, they are just making jokes, right? Sometimes exactly. it's a little bit difficult to see what is the joke, what is not, right? You need to yeah. have these uh, vibes. Yeah, it, they, they have a very inside mm -hmm. Inside There's, jokes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's kind of hard to, mm -hmm. to uh, understand what's going on at times, but I, I think it's very much fun. Mm -hmm. uh, but it, it's not only just jokes and yeah, yeah of course, of course, it, it's serious as well. So, mm -hmm. so I think uh, it's a it's a mix of both. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I've been listening a bit to the Chicken Chess uh, Chicken Chess Club. Yes, podcast, Chicken Chess I Podcast think. probably. Mm -hmm. Yeah, with um, Peter Heine Nielsen and Jan Gustafsson. Yeah, and, yeah. Um, Laurent Fessimé. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, I think that's a bit of fun as well. Uh, uh, also a bit of the inside jokes. Yeah. <laughs> but but uh, I, I like that one. And there's one that popped up recently uh, called... C-Square? Chess. 
Sorry? Invisible, invisible chess. Okay, I didn't hear that, is, to be honest. No, it's it's focused on blindfold chess. Oh, that's what you mean. Okay, got it. Yeah, mm -hmm. so, so, so basically they... I, I've just listened to one or two episodes. And mm -hmm. They present the game. They just tell uh, you the moves. I got and it. And they are just dictated the, the moves, right? Probably something like that. And you, mm -hmm. and you should try to... Yeah, 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 got it. Everything. Uh, definitely not for everyone, but I, I think it's fun. Mm -hmm. um, there are so many more podcasts out there. And what about uh, this two that I would like to ask you, especially because it's a curiosity that I couldn't sleep. The first one is Kevin, of course, our friend yeah. Dr. Uh, Dr. Yeah. Skull. And the second one is C-Square Podcast, because these are the different type of mm -hmm. one. And what do you think about them? Do you listen to them? Would you recommend them? I, I, I haven't listened to C-Squared, so mm -hmm. I don't know anything about that. Uh, I've listened to Kevin's podcast from time to time. Uh, I... I have it in my feed on, on mm -hmm. my phone, so I, I can see the episodes. And usually, I, I have so many podcasts to listen to, so, so I try to be a bit selective. Yeah. Uh, so, so if there's someone interesting that he has as a guest, then I, I listen to that. So I, I think that's very enjoyable. And what I like about Kevin's podcast is that he focuses on sort of the journey itself and how people experience being a chess player and improving adult and so mm -hmm. on. And I think that uh, some of the questions that comes from your audience here, uh, I think they will find the answers in that podcast because the, there will probably be a number of different interviews where they get those kinds of answers for, for instance, how to handle um, the plateaus and how to uh, find time to study and things like that, that, that all of us uh, sort of normal adult improvers are struggling with. So I think that's a great podcast. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much. And one more question, because I am pretty happy to make this wrap up in a moment. But before that, just one question, a very overall, very general one. What do you think about our community? in general, I mean chess community, and what would be the uh, near future? For example, in the next, next, let's say, two to three years, how it, uh, where it can go, what would be the trends and so on, in a general way. What is your vision, if I can ask? Um, I, I think the chess community overall is really, really great. Mm -hmm. uh, if I focus on, on the online community, which I think is uh, sort of the most important one, um, I think there are so many people who are um, providing great content without charging anything. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, <everyone. laughs> Thank um, you very much. <laughs> uh, all, all the bloggers, uh, I mean, there are so many sub stacks that you can, can subscribe to where you can get everything into your mailbox mm -hmm. for free. And very well selected, by the way, right? Because there are yeah, yeah, huge yeah. information ocean, but you have a very well selected and very well presented. That's the point. Exactly. Uh -huh. uh, so, so I think it's such a positive community in so many ways. Mm -hmm. uh, but I see that it's growing. Yeah. It's growing exponentially. So, so as I said, when when we started this chess punks hashtag, we were ten people at mm -hmm. the time. And, and it's just exploded. Yeah. Uh, with the uh, YouTube, mm -hmm. Test Network was, was the one. Yeah, the first one, the legendary. Now, now there are... Yeah, a bunch of... Yeah, the podcasts. Mm -hmm. Ben Johnson was alone. Yeah, the now father. Are, yeah, so many more. So, so I think this is a trend that's going to continue, that we're just going to see this boom. It's just growing in all directions. Mm -hmm. And something that that I I don't remember who it was. I think that it was on Ben Johnson's podcast. I heard an interview yeah. with someone who had recently started experimenting with uh, posting uh, short videos on YouTube. These mm -hmm. YouTube shorts okay. uh, with chess content, mm -hmm. which is, I, I haven't really seen that uh, before. But I think this might be something that we... Will the recent trend, I, I would say, because yeah, even Gotham yeah. Chess, he just started this, doing this as yeah, well. He mm -hmm. did as well. Okay, yeah. okay nice. Mm -hmm. so, so I think we will see, see that sort of taking off, maybe TikTok and other media like that that are sort of focused on these short videos uh, and other content like that. Mm -hmm. So bite-sized bite uh, content, I think, will be something that we will 
see more of in the future. Mm -hmm. Okay, excellent. Thank you very much. And one more question for wrapping up, but the, the last one, because we have just discussed all of the topics that we just agreed on. Uh, what do you think about today's meeting? I mean, this meeting that we are taking part and did you, uh, how did you feel? And did you get some insight into yourself with the stuff that we're talking about? Something like that you would share with others, that uh, you would say that it's very valuable, that you are with us and just sharing with this stuff. What could, how could you make the summary of that? Yeah, well, I, I, first of all, I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to come on uh, this broadcast. And uh, I think it's been a very enjoyable talk. Uh, I think it's always fun to talk with people who are like-minded. I see we, we see eye to eye on many issues, on chess improvement, on the choice chess of books, books uh -huh. yeah, and, <laughs> and a lot of different things. And yeah. I, I think that's all always very positive. And I'm, always happy to share my uh, my perspective on things with general community if, if there is some value in that so so I, I think it's been a very positive experience and uh, it's really reinforced my view as I said before of the chess community as a very positive place and a very enjoyable thing to be a part of so thank you a lot for that Okay, thank you very much. I really appreciate it because I really value your uh, content and that, that, the, that, that, the, the stuff that you do for our community. Thank you very much in behalf of our viewers and community in general, because uh, even though some people may seem that it's a pretty much uh, small part, but this small part makes the uh, piece together, right? It's some like hundreds of thousands of people. If they just make uh, one brick, it would be the big house, right? And that's why it's uh, that much important. And at the same time, I'm really happy because you are the chess group collector member, very active one uh, about your blog. And at the same time, whenever I just mentioned, uh, whenever I want to see the chess book review, many times I'm just popping up on your blog. And believe me, they, your reviews are very good one because they are very coherent one, very, uh, let's say, into the core. At, at the same time, you are providing the most necessary stuff. They are not super long, but they are something like the stuff that I really want to know before getting any, any other reviews, if I would like to have the expanded one and so on. Therefore, I'm really grateful and thankful for, for everything what you do for community. And especially I am pretty happy because maybe this would be the occasion to get into the Twitter and get Neil Bruce and all of the other guys into the community right here to put more stuff stuff to make the chess enjoyable as well. Definitely. Sounds good. Okay. Thank you very much one more time for uh, being with us, my friend, and for sharing all of the stuff that you did. I really appreciate it. And thank you very much. Take care. Thank you. Okay. Take care. Bye-bye. Nice See, See you. Bye-bye. Did you like it? We just make one hour 30 minutes with the time some like with super precision because i was looking lurking a little bit about the uh, timer and i am pretty happy that we could make it i didn't want to extend too much because we have just discussed all of the topics that i planned and in the meantime i'll, I'll, I'll i uh, just put some of the questions from the chat what about today's meeting I needed to look at the list with one eye and see which co which topics we just discussed and try to get into the mood and into the flow with the guest because I wanted to manage everything. But take notice, it was such a pleasure because I knew that our friend Dr. Patzer, he's so so passionate guy because I have listened to the podcast uh, about Kevin Skull. Kevin Skull is the chess journey guy that I would like to put him at some point uh, into the community right here with us to make the interview but our friend uh, uh, dr patzer our friend justin was so much passionate about chess and what is important the model role model if i can say that the take notice that it's not just my perspective that you shouldn't be too much focused over the rating especially the elo or any other type of rating but rather focused about the process being into the process, getting better, understanding more, having the opportunity to share the idea, share the analysis, watch together with others, play the, the, the games. This is the key that we do not need to be that much focused about all of the, uh, let's say, improvement in the sense of numbers. Because, of course, numbers may be important, but as long as you are not a professional chess player, it is making more harm than good. 
And that's why, especially with our friend Justin, when he mentioned that, that he was pretty much over ambitious because 2000 ELO is some like 24 or 2500 leeches rating at least because it may be a little bit more but some like with the estimation 24 to 25 uh, leeches rating at rapid not in a bullet but rapid it's pretty much super difficult if i if you would if you would like to know why it is that much difficult first of all because of the rating inflation second of all because of rating pull Third of all, because there are masses of players that are getting into the pool. And third of all, there are the chess prodigies and other people who are underrated. For example, you are, let's say, 1750 uh, rated ELO. There is the junior from India who is 1350. No matter what you do, you are losing. Why? Because he's playing at 21 level, uh, 2100 level, but his rating is not catching up his strength. You know what I mean? And then if you'll be focused exclusively about just gaining the rating, as long as you're not a professional player that earning the money for the living for playing chess, you shouldn't think about it that much. Of course, if you would like to get better, it's perfectly fine. But it is way better to be able to manage the game quality and the work you do instead of being uh, dependable on the ratings that are pretty much fluctuated. And that's the point being not rating oriented but process oriented and having the long-term goals not just the let's say short one but long-term goals i'm slowly getting into this goal to reach that what about that